In April, New York's Labor Department finalized updates to the state's sexual harassment model policy, which serves as a template for employers to follow to ensure compliance with anti-harassment and discrimination laws in the Empire State. New York first put in place its sexual harassment prevention model policy in 2018, which required employers to adopt a sexual harassment prevention policy and ensure workers received annual anti-harassment training. For more on the ramifications of the update, we're joined on the Capitol Press Room by New York State Labor Commissioner Roberta Reardon. Welcome back to the show, Commissioner. Thank you so much. It's nice to be here with you. Well, first off, what prompted this update? Is this a response to some sort of statutory obligation, or was there just a consensus that from time to time it made sense to reexamine this policy? No, actually, when they wrote the law, they also wrote in that we needed to review it every five years, which is a really smart thing to do. And that's why we jumped in. It was a great thing to do because, as you know, think about how the world has changed in the last five years. The pandemic alone has really changed the workplace. It's changed people's expectations. So we're very glad to be able to have this opportunity to update the policy. Well, you mentioned the pandemic. And ever since the arrival of COVID-19, more and more New Yorkers have shifted to remote work. Can you explain how, if at all, the new guidance responds to this dynamic? Yes. So we um, actually included new language to include remote workers. You know, in 2018, it wasn't so much of a thing. But now, um, obviously, you can be sexually harassed when you're working remotely. It could be by, by phone, email, text. People could be posting. Someone could be abusing you online and social media. So we made sure that the language covered remote workers because that's really so much of our workforce these days. Was there an assumption, though, that those workers were already protected and there just maybe wasn't the language specifically dealing with the instances that they might have experienced and thus you felt like you had to specifically outline these instances or or were they just not protected, period, because they were outside of the workplace setting? Well, actually, that's an interesting question because sexual harassment does not necessarily have to take place in the workplace. You can be sexually harassed at a company-sponsored event, a company-sponsored convention, a company-sponsored party. Uh, So there are lots of other ways where it can happen. But we wanted to be explicit about remote work because we realized it's it's a new part of, of the way we go to work, and we wanted to make sure that we were very clear in how to handle that. And what does the guidance say about uh, the rights uh, and protections for transgendered New Yorkers in the workplace? That is a great question. So we also were very aware that gender identity itself has really changed since 2018. We are much more aware of of differing gender identities, gender fluid, trans people, and we wanted to make sure that that was also covered in these in these laws because, you know, gender diversity is really essential. Understanding gender diversity is really essential to recognizing sexual harassment because discrimination based on sex stereotypes, gender expression, perceived identity, those are all forms of sexual harassment. We wanted to be very explicit that these, these were also covered under this law. It's very important that we all respect an individual's gender identity. Because, like you said, this is uh, an issue uh, where gender identity has kind of popped uh, on the scene in our public consciousness, really, in recent years, and maybe wasn't something we thought of, say, a a decade ago. Is there a learning curve for workers? Is there some sort of grading on a curve when it comes to (laughs) assessing sexual harassment in in the workplace when it comes to uh, transgender New Yorkers? Well, that's one reason we want to do these these trainings. That's a way for everybody to receive the same information, to understand, you know, what is covered, what your expected behavior is. And, you know, in, in sexual harassment, it's not the intent of the person saying or doing the things. It's how it's received by the other person that really makes the difference. So we want people to understand, and this is true of, of you know, sexual harassment training, you know, years before, I've been in sexual harassment training where people would say, well, I was just kidding. But your one person's joke is another person's insult. And it's making people aware that, that there are these sensitivities and we need to be aware of how we treat, you know, our fellow workers in the workplace. We mentioned that issue of intent, but you might have the person who transitioned while working at an office and then a coworker could theoretically dead name them or mm-hmm. something. And that might not 
necessarily even constitute a, a joke. It's just a, a slip up. And the person, though, might take serious offense to that. Is there some sort of reasonableness standard that is applied to something like that? Is the person yes. forgiven for you know one mistake, but multiple times of dead naming might be a real problem? So let's assume that someone dead names someone in the workplace and that person lodges a complaint to their HR person. The first line of, of defense on this will be sit down with the person who did the dead naming and have that conversation and say, you may not realize it was probably an error, but, but that's not this person's preferred name anymore, and it'd be better if you didn't do that again. If they continue to dead name them, then, then you have intent. Everybody makes mistakes. And, and, you know, we at the Department of Labor would much rather bring people into compliance than find them. Uh, and I think the same thing happens with a sexual harassment uh, model policy. We, we want people to understand what's happening and how it may have been received. But if somebody continues to do that kind of behavior, then the intent is very clear. Well, for listeners just joining us, you're listening to the Capitol Press Room, and we're speaking with New York State Labor Commissioner Roberta Reardon about updates to the state's sexual harassment model policy. And in anticipation for this interview, I was watching some of the video from the September 2022 hearing that you conducted. And in that hearing, a speaker made the recommendation that the model policy uh, ensure an employee who's harassed isn't subject to either a non-disclosure agreement or prevented in any way from publicly discussing what they may have experienced. Did that type of language make it into this final guidance? Um, you know, I don't know specifically if we talk about NDAs. I'd have to go back and look at it. But we do have very specific language about retaliation. We have retaliation law across the board in, in the DOL, but very specifically on sexual harassment. If an employer or supervisor punishes an individual for lodging a complaint or tries to suppress uh, someone who witnessed that from coming forth and testifying or, you know, says, uh, you know, you're going to get a worse schedule now because I don't like that you that you, you know, brought this up. That's all retaliation and that's covered under the policy. It is not allowed. So, you know, it's a very serious, you know, when you're in a position of authority, you have the ability to uh, make life difficult for people who work for you. And we're trying to prevent that. We want to make sure that everybody knows that they should be free to come forth if they have issues. It should be dealt with appropriately. And retaliation is never allowed. Well, well on that topic, though, then, of publicly discussing what someone might have experienced, is that something that you're, I guess, philosophically supportive of? I, I know people who have been sexually, well, I've been sexually harassed in the workplace, you know, not any time in the recent past, but I've experienced it. And it sometimes is um, difficult to talk about it publicly, not because it's not lawful, but because you may not feel comfortable doing it. But people have lots of different ways of dealing with these things. And I think they should be able to seek the help they need and be able to talk about what happened to them. It shouldn't be a shameful experience. So what do employers do now with this new information that you've put out? We have a new uh, video that we just finished. We released it yesterday. It's a little bit under an hour, and, you know, the law says you have to, you have to provide this training. Our video is a model policy training video, and it's free for anybody who wants to use it. You can download it right off our website. There is a form that the, the worker needs to fill out after the video to, to answer questions so it's interactive. And you can do it privately on your own computer or you can, the employer can have people in a room and show it to everybody in the room. Uh, we also have a PowerPoint uh, available for people who would rather do it that way. And there's an FAQ, a toolbox. There's lots of, lots of help on the website. Um, Obviously, if an employer wants to hire a third party to come in and do their training, they're certainly allowed to do that as long as their training meets the state's requirements. Um, any way you want to do it, but the main thing is please make sure that your employees understand, you know, what, what they should expect to be, how they should expect to be treated in the workplace. And employers, you know, this indemnifies employers as well, you know, by, by providing this training, they are saying, I take this seriously and I frown on this behavior in my company. And aside from talking with charming and influential radio hosts, what is the state doing to ensure that employers around the state, especially those without an HR department, uh, are cognizant of the updates to the model harassment policy? Well, we're doing a lot of outreach. I know that DHR, which is actually where the, mo where the policy is um, 
implemented. You know, we don't actually have – we don't investigate these claims. It goes to the Division of Human Rights, and they, they take care of it. So we're all doing our own outreach from the agencies. We have a very broad social media campaign that we're doing. Um, I know when our business services reps go out from our workforce development area, they also talk about, you know, the model policy is available. Now, there are lots of ways to help employers know that this is expected of them. And, um, you know, we're going to pursue all the avenues. And talking to charming radio hosts like yourself is a great way to get the word out. And that's probably just fun for you on a personal level as well. It is. It really is. So you mentioned uh, the Division of Human Rights and their responsibility to investigate claims. Is there any broader monitoring or oversight, checking for like compliance of these trainings and the training requirements? Like, is the Department of Labor doing any sort of audits, for example? You know, I'm not sure if we are officially doing audits. Obviously, when we go out and talk to employers. It's one of the things that we check in on, but I, I can find out for you if there's an actual you know, checklist that we do. Uh, DHR probably has their own process as well. I should say, you know, if somebody thinks that they are experiencing sexual harassment in the workplace, obviously their first line of defense is to talk to their supervisor or go to their HR department. If they're not comfortable doing that, there's a hotline at DHR. It's 1-800-HARASS-3, H-A-R-A-S-S-3. And you can also send an email to DHR at complaints at dhr.ny.gov. So there are a lot of different avenues to pursue these, these claims. Obviously, we think the best way first is to talk to your supervisor and see if that can, it can work itself out within the workplace without having to go more officially. But, but these avenues are open to everybody. Well, finally, you mentioned uh, the new video that the department has put together. And for most uh, private employers, uh, a video is really what uh, they go through to get their annual training. Um, Mm -hmm. But back in 2021, uh, Governor Hochul uh, committed the state uh, to ensuring that its workforce was getting in-person training uh, for the the state workers. Any idea uh, how that's going? Has that been implemented yet, uh, that that, uh, live training for the state workforce? Um, We all have extensive trainings that we all do every year, and um, I don't know if we've done the in-training sexual harassment training yet, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of training that each of us, including me, take every year. It's really really important. I just finished my ethics training last week, uh, which I do every year as well. Learn anything new this year? Nope, just, you know, what not to do. It's always good to hear it from Jerome, who's our ethics officer. He's He's good at it. And it's actually, it's a great thing to to go through every year because it reminds you things that, you know, uh, you might forget that, you know, it's just not acceptable. Don't take that present. Nobody can take you out to lunch. You know, we all pick up our own meal tickets um, because we're public servants. Well, we've been speaking with New York State Labor Commissioner Roberta Reardon. Commissioner Reardon, thank you so much for making the time. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much. And enjoy this beautiful weather today. Support for the Capitol Press Room provided by the Independent Power Producers of New York. IPNY's annual Clean Energy Spring Conference and Showcase is set for May 9th and 10th at the Albany Capitol Center. More information at IPPNY.org.